Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Our speaker today is Dr. Dale Bratzler. He will be speaking on enhancing patient quality in the teaching hospital setting. The program is underwritten by an educational grant through the OSU Medical Center and Graduate Medical Education. A disclosure statement is on file. Dr. Bratzler is a professor um, in the Department of Health Administration and Policy and an Associate Dean in the College of Public Health and a Professor of Medicine at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Dr. Bretzler has worked in the field of health care quality measurement and improvement for many years, and he served in various roles, including medical director and chief executive officer for the Oklahoma Foundation for Medical Quality over a period of nearly 20 years. Dr. Bretzler is currently a member of the Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee for the CDC. He received his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree at the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences and his Master of Public Health degree from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center College of Public Health. His background includes both private and a university-based practice of general internal medicine. Let's welcome Dr. Bratzler this morning. Well, good morning and thank you. So the one thing she didn't say, I actually trained here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I actually did my internship and residency program here and practiced here for about 10 years. It was actually the, uh, oh yeah, Brenda reminds me, I was director of medical education here for three years also in the past. So, so just real quickly, it's a really good turnout this morning. I'm, I'm curious, in any of your orientation, whether you're an intern, a resident, a medical student here on rotation, has anybody talked to you much about your impact on quality of care here in the hospital setting. And do you, do, how many of you understand that what you do and the care that you provide and the way you interact with patients will actually impact the way this hospital gets paid? Do you guys understand that? So let me, I'm going to walk through and highlight some of the programs that hospitals are held accountable for now around quality of care and very explicitly, what I want to do is talk a little bit about how you, as house officers and others, will have an impact on what happens both for the reputation of the center, but also the way it will impact payment for the medical center going forward. And I'm going to try to keep this a bit informal, so if you have questions as I go through the presentation, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. So these are the three objectives I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's at stake in hospital quality, and why it's important that you think about it now that you're actually in the center taking care of patients, interacting with patients. And I certainly want to make sure that you know what you can do to make a difference as students, residents, fellows, interns. And finally, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the way healthcare is shifting in terms of the model for payment and I think it'll be very important that you at least have some understanding of this because it's going to impact, I think, fairly significantly the way all of us that work in healthcare see reimbursement for the future. <clears throat> so, if you read anything, you know that payment reform in healthcare is happening. And it's actually happening a lot more rapidly now in Oklahoma, I think, than most people thought it would. It's been happening on the coast for quite a while, but I will tell you, it's not only programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and others, but insurance companies now are coming to my office all the time and telling me the way they're going to change payment for our physician practice and for our hospital. It's happening quite rapidly in Oklahoma, and we'll talk more about it. But there, you know, one of the questions that often comes up, well, why do we need to reform payment? I'm not going to go through the data that shows, as you know, that the United States more, spends more on health care than any other industrialized nation in the world, a whole lot more. Um, and you also probably know that in the United States we don't have necessarily the best health, health outcomes. Uh, life expectancy is much longer in many other countries than it is in the United States. So we, we have a very expensive health system in the United States, uh, but we actually don't have a very healthy population, and that's caught a lot of people's attention. We've had a healthcare system for many, many years that rewarded volume of care. So certainly when I was in practice, the more patients I saw, the more visits, the more tests, the more procedures, the more I got paid. And that's the way the system historically has worked. The 
more you do, the more you get paid. It's the old fee-for-service world. You do a service, you bill for it, you get paid for it. Without regard for the quality of that care or whether it was even necessary. There are lots of things, I will tell you, there are lots of things that we do in healthcare that actually don't help patients very much, if at all. And all of them have some risk. So let me highlight some of those in just a moment. The, the other thing that a lot of people understand now is that payment, the payment models that we've had don't promote coordination of care across settings. So I will tell you that I work on a campus that has two big hospitals. We have the adult hospital, the children's hospital, and then we have a very large physician practice. We have about 950 credential providers in our practice. Our EMRs don't talk to each other. Literally, patients will be seen in our clinics, have tests done, and go across the street to the hospital and potentially have them repeated again uh, because we can't coordinate care. We don't have the electronic communication literally across our system. We're getting ready to change that. But it just simply highlights that payment models have not promoted this concept of coordinating care across settings. We tend to just keep paying for things and doing things over and over again whether the patient actually needs it or not. And finally, there's been no incentive in healthcare to think about cost of care other than your personal interaction with the patient because it's becoming increasingly common when you talk to patients, they'll want to know about how much this is going to cost, the co-pays, deductibles, and other things that go with it. We have real challenges in healthcare. You may have seen the headlines recently. Medical errors may be the third leading cause of death in the United States. The lay press really picked this up. So we know we spend a lot of money on health care, and yet medical errors itself may be the third leading cause of death in the United States, following only cancer and cardiovascular disease. So let's just talk about what are some of the patient safety concerns that you need to be aware of. Healthcare associated infections. Up to a third of patients in healthcare settings will develop some type of healthcare associated infection. Most minor, but when patients get healthcare associated infections, they don't tend to do very well. Antibiotic res resistance. Is there anybody in the room that hasn't heard all of the communication recently about antibiotic resistance? And yet, we continue to prescribe antibiotics for things that have never been shown to benefit from antibiotics, like viral upper respiratory infections. So, antibiotic resistance. Use of personal protective equipment. I hope in your training that you get trained on use of personal protective equipment because if we have another outbreak of disease like SARS or Ebola or something else, you need to understand how to use personal protective equipment and use it in a way that protects both you and your patients. Hand hygiene, okay, we've been working on this one for 100 years. And yet I bet, I will bet money if I went upstairs and just stood outside of some room and watched how often the staff going in and out of the patient's rooms did hand hygiene. I bet I would find lots of opportunity for improvement. Health IT, I'm not going to talk about too much. Medication error is still a huge problem. Workforce safety, you know, what percentage of your workforce has had all of their vaccines? What percentage of the workforce knows how to deal with things like needle stick injuries and other things? Transitions of care, we know that many medical errors occur when a patient goes from one setting of care to another setting of care. I was recently in a meeting here in Tulsa with a group of skilled nursing facilities, and those skilled nursing facilities were actually looking at discharge orders that were coming from hospitals to the skilled nursing facilities. And when they went back and looked, oftentimes there were numerous errors on the medications that were on the discharge list from the hospital that went to the skilled nursing facility. This was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They were saying, you guys got to do a better job of getting correct information about what medications you want the patients to take when they come to the skilled nursing facility because we're not doing it very well. Diagnostic errors, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, and then patient satisfaction. I hope one thing I impress upon you today is that your interactions with patients will impact the hospital score on patient satisfaction and engagement. Let me just digress for just a second about diagnostic errors. How many of you have heard of the concept of diagnostic errors? 
It's now considered one of the most common medical errors today. And the statistics are kind of frightening. So when you look at the data, 9% of patients will experience a major diagnostic error that's detected at autopsy. Autopsy. <laughs> Recently testified in a case, and I wanted to one of the things I highlighted was we don't like to wait until the autopsy to make the correct diagnosis. So 9% of patients will experience a major diagnostic error that goes undetected while the patient's still alive. 9%, that's really scary. There are lots of reasons, and diagnostic errors is a whole lecture into itself, but one that we should have some time talking about why doctors make mistakes in diagnosis. The common reasons are we tend to see the things that we're familiar with. So that patient that comes in with chest pain, we've seen 10 chest pain patients in the last six months, and all of them had ischemic heart disease, and then that one comes in, maybe has some ST segment changes, has some chest pain, but it's now dissecting aortic aneurysm, and we miss it, and they bleed to death. Diagnostic errors are actually fairly common in healthcare, and one of the new major areas of focus of improving healthcare quality. And then it's also believed that about 17% of all hospital preventable errors are actually caused by diagnostic error. So what do we mean by diagnostic error? It's essentially either inaccurate or delayed diagnoses, making the diagnosis too late or the wrong diagnosis. All right, rapid response. That's actually something that grew out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, uh, highlighting that you can actually reduce mortality by having rapid response teams. The other, the other thing I wanted to highlight is that we waste a ton of money in healthcare. I'm just going to highlight one of those areas, unnecessary services. It's currently believed that about 25% of everything we do for healthcare for patients is unnecessary. Um, it's a huge amount of money. Um, $750 billion wasted each year, but a quarter of that due to unnecessary services, doing things that don't add to the patient's outcome. <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to highlight is that consumer groups now completely are demanding transparency. I do a lot of work with the Consumers Union, and they are absolutely demanding that quality data be in the public domain. So you are going to hear about it more and more, but truly for the rest of your career when you're in practice, data about the quality of care that you give and the cost of your care will be in the public domain. It will be in the public domain, so just expect that. So we have high cost of health care. Medical errors are really common, maybe the third leading cause of death. Health care outcomes aren't good. We don't have the highest life expectancy in the world, even though we spend a lot more money than most countries. We have lots of diagnostic error that are happening. And consumer groups said, you know, we're kind of tired of it. We, we, want, we want data out there on the quality of health care, and we want to know how much it costs to get that care. So Congress has responded, and they've passed a whole bunch of laws since 2003 that basically are changing the way that health care is going to be paid for, moving away from the concept of paying for just volume, plain old fee for service, to a system of payment that holds you accountable for the quality of care and pays you based on how good your quality is and how efficient you are, i.e., do you keep your costs down? And that's the message I want to get to you today, is that you need to understand those models because it's going to impact the payment to OSU Medical Center, and you guys all will have an impact on that payment. So there was this growing recognition. The United States has the best sick care system in the world. It's high-tech, complex care. It's hospital-based, procedural-based, specialty-based. We're really good. When people get really sick, we're good at it. 
and you're going to go upstairs and you're going to learn all about complex, really sick patients. The problem is we spend all that money waiting until the patients are really sick and we don't keep them healthy in the first place. And that's what's changing in healthcare is this movement to hold people accountable for keeping the population healthy, not just taking care of them when they're really sick. I'm not going to spend time talking about the laws. I'll mention two things. The first I wanted to highlight is that, as you know, there's a presidential election happening right now. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard that at least one of the candidates is, has sworn he will, he will uh, repeal Obamacare. Um, I just want to highlight there are certain pieces of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, that aren't going to go away. And one of them is this transition away from fee-for-service payment. The report to Congress that was sent to Congress in 2007 that became a part of the Affordable Care Act that's changing the way health care is paid for was written by the George Bush administration. Secretary Levitt is the person who sent this report to Congress. So what I hope I make the point as I go through this conversation about the way healthcare payment is shifting is that that piece of it, moving away from fee-for-service, volume-based payment to value-based payment is very, very bipartisan and will not go away. And I'll show you another example in just a moment. So the Affordable Care Act was passed, signed by the President in 2010. Parts of it people hate, but parts of it aren't going away. The move to value is not going away. Value is defined as high quality care and high service, i.e. patient satisfaction, at the lowest cost. So think about how you can start thinking about delivering care, high quality, making sure we do evidence-based care, guideline-based care, but do so at the lowest cost efficiently. So that's what we want, high quality care at the lowest cost. So let me just run through a list. These are the measures that impact OSU Medical Center's Medicare payment today. And as I go through this list, I'm not going to go talk through all the measures. I just want to highlight the categories. But what I want you guys to do is look at this list and think about, can I as a house officer in OU Medical Center have an impact on these events? Because these events are the ones that will impact payment at the hospital. So. Healthcare associated infections, central line associated bloodstream infections. Does the skill that you provide putting in central lines have an impact on the infection rates? Do you follow a bundle? Do you make sure you practice before you do it? Catheter associated urinary tract infections. I know our hospital, I don't know what you're doing here. Our hospital will not let house staff put in a urinary catheter until they've gone through formal training and have been signed off by nursing on appropriate skills for doing urinary tract catheters. Won't let them put them in because if you don't put them in correctly, if you leave them in too long, they cause infections. Surgical infections, MRSA, bacteremia, C. difficile infections, the biggest risk factor for that is what? Antibiotics, correct, too many antibiotics. And have you all and do all the healthcare workers in this hospital get their influenza vaccination rates every year? The hospital is held accountable for those things. It's publicly reported, and if those infection rates are high, if your influenza vaccination rates are low, your Medicare payment for this medical center will be reduced. So can you have an impact? Process of care measures. How long does it take patients waiting in the emergency room? Uh, do you give influenza vaccine to inpatients during flu season? What's the rate of C-section prior to the 39th week? You know, that's a huge issue because once you start doing C-sections before the 39th week, the likelihood that the patient ends up in a neonatal intensive care unit goes dramatically up. Sepsis management. Do you have protocols in place for early identification of sepsis and management based on sepsis guidelines? Stroke care and prevention of deep vein thrombosis. Again, if the hospital does not do these things well, the hospital's Medicare payment will be cut. And again, I think all of you can have some impact on some of these rates. 30-day mortality rates for heart attack, heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, stroke, and coronary artery bypass surgery. Now you may think, what can I do as a house officer to impact 30-day mortality rates? 
Well, I think the one thing you can do is make sure that when you're taking care, for example, of a heart attack patient, that you take time, look at the guidelines, make sure that you're giving guideline-based care for all the appropriate interventions that have been shown to reduce mortality. So if they have poor left ventricular function, you have them on ACEs or ARBs, you have them on aspirin, you've managed their condition to make sure they're doing well. 30-day readmission rates. AMI, heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, stroke, cabbage, total hip and knee arthroplasty, and all cause readmissions. If the hospital's readmission rate is high, it has a substantial impact on the hospital's payment rate under the Medicare program. So again, here you have to think about how do I coordinate care? When that patient leaves the hospital, do they, are they seen in one of our clinics or in a primary care clinic? Do they have really good discharge instructions? Do they have the skills they need to take care of themselves when they go home? Or does their family have the skills? Think about what happens on the day of discharge. Somebody comes in, writes out a whole bunch of instructions to the patient. In the hospital, we fed the patient, we handed them their pills, we've done everything for them, and then they go home and they're expected to do it all for themselves. Are they prepared for that transition and are you gonna be able to keep them from coming back into the hospital? <clears throat> Total cost of care I'm going to talk about a bit more, but the care you deliver and how much it costs actually impacts the hospital's payment now. Complication rates, surgery, hip and knee arthroplasty, excess days in the hospital, patient safety culture. How many of you in this room, I'm curious, if you saw an adverse event happen or a near miss, somebody almost do something that almost harmed a patient but got caught, how many of you guys know what to do with that information. Is there a phone number to call, an email address to send it to? Do you guys know that? Does everybody know it? You need to know it. I, trust me, when ACGME comes in and interviews you, they're gonna come and meet with the residents and they're gonna say, what do you do if you see a near miss? They'll wanna know if you know how to report near misses. What's your patient safety culture? And is in surgery are you using safe surgery checklist? <clears throat> So let me talk about cost efficiency for measure again. Here's the way Medicare holds hospitals accountable for cost efficiency. So here's a hospital stay. Let's say you have a patient come into the hospital with heart failure. <clears throat> so the patient's in the hospital for five days. Medicare holds you accountable for all cost of care for that patient from three days before they come into the hospital until 30 days post-discharge. Medicare rolls up all of the cost including inpatient care, outpatient care, drugs, rehabilitation, skilled nursing, anything Medicare pays for, rolls all those costs up, calculates what the expected cost for that patient is based on their severity of illness for that episode of heart failure care. And if your costs are above the expected cost, then Medicare reduces payment to the hospital. So, Think about whether there are things that you could do that have the potential to impact overall cost of care for a patient. You never want to withhold things that patients need. But how often do we do things for patients that they don't need? And can we impact those costs? So here's some great examples of unnecessary care. These are real examples. So patients admitted to the intensive care unit, didn't have a cardiac condition, but somebody had standing orders that required a daily blood troponin, and the patient had a troponin done on 26 consecutive days during the hospital stay. There's no guideline that suggests doing daily troponins for anybody, but some reason somebody put a standing order into place and piles of tests were done that did not add value to the patient's care, but just cost extra money. I love the second example, a schizophrenic patient complaining of abdominal pain, sent to the emergency department. The patient has a normal CT in the, abdominal, in the uh, ER, admitted to the hospital for further workup and pain control. And then when somebody went back and either went to the HIE, My Health, or went to some other source and looked at the record, they found out the patient had had 40 CTs over the previous five years, all of them normal, and nothing had ever been found wrong. So unnecessary imaging, it happens a lot in a lot of different settings. 
Another great one that I saw in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine uh, about the preoperative chest X-ray. You know there's absolutely no indication for a routine preoperative chest X-ray. Now certainly when I was in my training, it was part of a standing set of orders that everybody got a preoperative chest X-ray, your analysis, coags. Almost none of those tests are helpful for a patient having surgery. Almost none of them. But here's a great example. A patient had, um, um, you know, it exposes the patient to additional studies, prolonged surgical delay. So the case was, yeah, here's the case. Middle-aged man had an asthma diagnosis years before, but no symptoms. Patient is completely 100% asymptomatic, has an umbilical hernia. So the surgeon orders a preoperative chest X-ray. Well, the radiologist, you know, they read it and said, possible lung nodule, so that led to a follow-up CT scan. Well, there's no lung nodule, but they found a possible adrenal gland nodule, an incidentaloma, uh, and then they had a second CT scan that showed a benign lesion, <clears throat> but effectively delayed the patient's surgery by six months, got two CT scans and a chest X-ray uh, that was all completely unnecessary. It happens all the time. We do test and then we find things that are unexpected. Most of the time, we do more harm than good by chasing those. So unnecessary testing. So I want, again, you guys to think about, can you have an impact on some of these costs of care? The other point I want to make is that it seems benign. Well, we just did a, you know, had a schizophrenic patient with abdominal pain. They've had 40 in the last five years, but we just wanted to make sure and did another CT scan. Well, recognize that one CT scan provides the radiation dose of about 400 chest x-rays. Now, somebody my age, probably not that big a deal. But somebody your age that has another 50, 60 years of life in front of you, potential risk for cancer from radiation exposure. So well known that there is nothing that we do in medicine that's completely benign. There is the potential for impact. So I'm not, again, I'm not saying withhold treatment that's necessary, but think about whether it's necessary and be careful about delivering it. The last point I want to make that hospitals are held accountable for today is patient satisfaction. So after a Medicare patient goes home from the hospital, hospitals are required to survey the patients, submit that data to the Medicare program, it's publicly reported for the hospital, and it's used to adjust hospital payment. So I just highlight two areas. Doctor communication. How patients perceive the doctors communicate with them impacts hospital payment. Pain management, by the way, just got taken off the list because Medicare was concerned that the pain management questions on the survey might be driving doctors to be too liberal with opioids. For patients. <clears throat> so what happens with all this data? So CMS takes that infection data, processes of care, mortality rates, readmissions, patient satisfaction data, cost of care. They roll it up into a score. They send OSU a medical center a report and says, here's your value-based purchasing score. We're either going to give you an incentive or we're going to cut your payment based on the overall score. So let me ask you a group of, and, and it's publicly reported on Hospital Compare. In fact, there's Physician Compare, Nursing Home Compare, Dialysis Compare, there's Health Grades, there's LeapFrog Group. Again, just expect data on quality of care to be in the public domain for the rest of your career. So I want to ask you guys some rhetorical questions. Oh, by the way, I just got this email. Uh, Medicare just released 2014 quality data for individual physicians and group practices and let people download it. So not only are they publicly reporting it, but now they create files that can be publicly downloaded. So researchers and others that want to look at your quality of care can download your data. Medicare also does this for Medicare payment data. So let me ask you some rhetorical questions. When a patient, particularly an elderly patient, gets a survey days to weeks after discharge and they're asked, 
about doctor communication. Did the doctor communicate clearly with you? Did they explain your medications? Do you think they know the difference between a medical student, intern, resident, fellow, or an attendant? My contention is they have no clue. They just see every one of you as a doctor. And the way that you communicate with patients impacts the score that impacts hospital payment. When the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services holds OSU Medical Center accountable for total cost of care for an episode, do you think they care that this is a teaching institution or that student learners may have ordered some of the tests? Nope. There is no adjustment for teaching centers. Now, it's recognized that teaching centers tend to be a bit more expensive uh, because you are learners and sometimes you'll order things that may or may not be needed. But just recognize, when you're in the system ordering test procedures or other things for patients, just remember it impacts overall cost of care, which impacts the hospital's payment. And finally, when a consumer goes out and goes to hospital compared to look up the quality of care at the hospital, um, or they see it in a local newspaper because every once in a while, CMS, by the way, is getting ready to put out star ratings on hospitals. So that's going to come out sometime potentially this month, star ratings for hospitals. So you can bet that that will get picked up by the local newspapers when they start giving star ratings. You think the patients care if the complication or infection was caused by a trainee or an attendant. Remember, complications are publicly reported. So the quality of care, the cost of care, the things that you do for patients as trainees here will impact the way this hospital gets paid, OSU Medical Center, and it's going to be very important for the future. So I would just say that Congress and therefore Medicare program now is really, really serious about changing the way healthcare is paid for. Move to eliminate volume-based payment, the old fee-for-service system. Hold all providers accountable for the quality of their care and hold all providers accountable for the total cost of care. So one of the most recent ones that happened in Oklahoma is something called the Comprehensive uh, Joint Replacement Program, where Medicare will now pay kind of a fixed fee for hip arthroplasty, and they hold the hospital, the doctors, post-discharge rehab, all accountable for the cost of care. And if the costs are too high, then you have to pay back part of that money. So you have to care, if you're a hospital administrator, how much the rehab unit's charging and how much their cost of care and what their length of stay is and are they efficient. So it's making us all start to work together across settings of care to think about total costs. This is the model that's happening now. So we're going from a system where you got paid more for doing more to a system where you profit by keeping your patients healthy. So my example is that if in the Medicaid program, I'm working with Medicaid now, to think about how we deliver asthma care to kids. Guess what? Asthma is one of the most common reasons that kids come to the emergency department. Now, there's lots of things we can do to prevent that. We can prescribe the right medications. We can put them on controllers. We can give them stoplight reports and other things to try to keep them out of the ER. But my contention is if I'm getting paid a lump sum to take care of a population of kids with asthma, I may spend my money better doing mold abatement in their home or killing the roaches in their home with an exterminator or buying them a new mattress that's dust mite free than prescribing a whole bunch of pills or inhalers because I know that the most likely reason a kid with asthma comes back into the emergency room is because of environmental triggers. So it's changing the mindset of the way we deliver health care from we need to prescribe more, we need to figure out what to keep the patients healthy and keep them out of the system. Hospitals become a cost center. And the Medicare program has made it very clear that by 2018, 50% of all Medicare payment they want in value-based contracts 90% of all Medicare payment tied in some way to quality measures. So they're moving rapidly. The other thing that's happening is locally is that the other 
payers, Blue Cross, community care, and others, they're doing the same thing. It's not just Medicare. Last thing I want to just mention is that this is coming to the physician office also. And while I know most of you now are doing your training in the hospital setting, I'm going to strongly encourage you to learn ambulatory health care. Because my sense is that while we'll always have a need for hospitals, there are always going to be car wrecks and patients with cancer and things that can't be predicted or prevented, that health care for a lot of elective stuff is going to move to the ambulatory setting. And there's going to be this real focus on keeping people healthy and out of the hospital, not waiting until they get really sick and putting them in the hospital. So diabetic, COPD, all those preventable conditions that if we do a better job in the ambulatory setting, we could potentially keep them forever needing to be in the hospital setting. So you need to understand ambulatory care. So today, already, physician practices of 10 or more doctors have their payment under Medicare modified by a quality score and a cost score. So our practice, OU Physicians in Oklahoma City, 950 providers, since 2015 we've been held accountable for cost of care and quality of care. We get a report card every year, and it tells us exactly how much we're spending on health care. We are being held accountable now, and it impacts our payment as a group. Well, Congress just passed a law, and here's the second point I want to make about this movement to value-based payment is very bipartisan. So this was the big bill that got rid of the sustainable growth rate formula. You probably heard about it last year. It's called MACRA. You'll hear a lot more about it. But here's what I wanted to highlight. The sponsor for the bill was a Republican from Texas, a very red state. The sponsor of the bill is a physician, Mike Burgess. This bill passed a very Republican-controlled Senate and House, and the vote wasn't even close. It was extremely bipartisan. Most Democrats voted for the bill also. So what does this bill do? This bill strongly moves physician payment away from fee-for-service to value-based care. Physician data is already publicly reported on physician compare. And more, more data will be out there soon. So what's going to happen in 2019 is that every physician will have to make a decision. They either have to have a substantial portion of their Medicare payment coming from one of those models where you're paid to keep the population healthy, accountable care, rather than fee-for-service, or if you elect to stay in the fee-for-service system, then you're going to be a part of something called the merit-based incentive payment system, and your office will get a score. And if the score is above the threshold, you'll get bonuses, and if the score is below the threshold, you'll get payment penalties. Again, it doesn't matter, I think, what happens in the presidential election. This piece of health care reform is extremely bipartisan that we're moving away from the old system of just do more, get paid more. 4% of your payment under Medicare is subject. In 2019, it goes up to 9%. That's not just what you do in the office. That's everything you do, inpatient and outpatient. So if you're a surgeon and you operate on Medicare patients, you're held accountable for all costs of care. And if your costs are high and your quality is poor, up to 9% of your payment in 2019, uh, 2022, I'm sorry, would be subject. That's everything that you bill Medicare, inpatient and outpatient, even though the score is based on your outpatient care. And here's how it's scored in 2019. 50% of the score on your quality of care in your office. 10% of the score based on your total cost of care for your patients. 15% on whether your office is doing clinical practice improvement, and 25% on whether you're using your electronic medical record meaningfully. I'm not going to go through all the details of this law because I'm not here to talk about ambulatory care, but you need to understand that in your physician office setting, you're going to be held accountable for quality, cost, 
doing performance improvement and for using your electronic medical record in a way that allows patients to interact with their records. Resource use. I want to highlight this one because it's 10% of your score in the first year. By the way, if you look in 2021, it becomes 30% of the score on how much it costs you to take care of your patients. But CMS is going to graciously calculate for you 40 different episode-based cost metrics for your practice, which includes all cost of care for your care in the office, but also any care that's delivered in the hospital for your patients. So you're going to be held accountable for all costs for that patient episode, and I'll show you an example in just a moment. So they roll up all the cost of inpatient, outpatient care, imaging, laboratory drugs, rehabilitation, and if your costs are high, you'll get a low score for resource use, and if your costs are lower, you'll get a higher score. <clears throat> and this is what happens in 2019. Here's the threshold. CMS will set it. It'll be a score, 0 to 100. If you're up here, you'll get a bonus. If you're down here, you'll get a penalty. By law, the bill says this program has to be budget neutral, which means that for CMS to pay incentives, there have to be losers. So you know this line will always be somewhere na near the national median, <clears throat> and anybody below the median will get penalties, and above the median will get payment incentives. So why is that important in the hospital setting? Because now you're going to be held accountable for cost of care in your physician office, but that includes all of the inpatient costs for your patients also. So you're going to want to think about, am I sending them to a facility that's efficient with resources? Do the doctors I refer them to, do they know how to take care of the patient? Guideline-based, evidence-based, high-quality care at the lowest cost. You have to start thinking about the care across settings and know whether or not you're doing a good job. Okay, you say, I don't want to be in that payment system. I don't want to be in the whole... Um, MIP scoring, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go to the value-based payment models. Well, the problem is, um, and, and that's really good. If you do that, you get a 5% Medicare bonus every year for five years. The only problem is you have to accept financial risk so that if your cost of care are too high, you have to pay part of the money back. And that's why not many doctors are ready to take financial risk for the care they deliver to the Medicare population. Again, it's not just Medicare. I've talked a lot about Medicare because it has a big impact on the hospital payment today, but all the major insurers are doing it too. In my office over the past few weeks, Aetna, Humana, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're all doing it. They're all changing the way they reimburse health care. So in my practice, as an example, all the Medicare Advantage plans now hold us accountable for preventive services, Medicare wellness visits, and prescription compliance. And if our rates are low, we can see penalties. Blue Cross Blue Shield, we now have a shared savings contract that basically says if we can deliver care cost effectively to our Blue Cross patients and reduce overall cost of care, Blue Cross will split the savings with us, will profit from spending less on the patients. But if our costs are too high, then we have to pay back part of the dollars. And Aetna has a star rating program already, and it's largely based on whether your cost of care are reasonable for the episode. So this is what's happened in my office. Medical director of a large payer wants to know why our doctors are sending patients to the hospital to get x-rays done. We think, well, of course I do that. That's where our radiology residents and others are. Problem is, at least in our city, if patients go to our teaching hospital for an MRI or a CT scan, it costs four times as much than if we send them to a freestanding center in town. So this large insurance company is saying, why are you doing that? Because we're going to start holding you accountable for cost of care. It costs you four times more. They also told us that they were going to have a preferred laboratory and that if our hospital laboratory was too expensive, then we, in our clinics, we would have to bring in whatever their preferred laboratory was for services because they're going to hold us accountable for cost of care. They don't want us doing chemotherapy in hospital outpatient departments because it's a lot more expensive than doing it in freestanding clinics when it's safe and appropriate. 
So in healthcare, hospitals have always been the driver of dollars. Patients come to hospitals and we generate lots of money in hospitals. And it pays for teaching programs for, for the OSU and for OU. But in reality, in the world that the payment systems are changing, care is moving to the outpatient setting. And the goal is going to be to keep people out of the hospital, keep them healthy. So we'll always have hospitals. There will always be some patients in hospitals, but maybe not as many. Maybe some of those diabetic COPD patients, heart failure patients that we don't do a very good job in ambulatory care, we could keep out of the hospital if we coordinated better. And finally, I want to highlight something called reference pricing, which now has hit Oklahoma. This is health choice. This is the state employee's health plan, particularly the state employee retiree's health plan. So if you go to this website today, it tells you where you can go to get certain tests done. So the first one they did was colonoscopy. They looked at the Oklahoma City market and said, how much does it cost to pay for a colonoscopy? They looked at the average cost. They set a cost. They then tell the patient, so you send one of your patients for a colonoscopy, but you don't send them to one of the preferred centers. They actually call the patient at the time you do pre-authorization and say, you know that if you go where that doctor sent you, you're going to have to pay all the difference between our reference price and their cost out of pocket. But if you go to one of our reference places, uh, you have no out-of-pocket charges. So what they're doing is aggressively pricing in the market called reference pricing, and the patients can still go wherever they want, but they got to pay the difference if where they go is more expensive than the place that has the reference price. And they call the patients and tell them that. <laughs> they tell them, you know, you can go where the doctor sends you, but it's free if you go over here. No, no out-of-pocket cost. So this is what one of the report cards look like. And again, this is real now. So every blue dot on here is a physician practice in the United States that has more than 10 doctors. The red dot is OU physicians. And you can see for our group, we're above average on quality, but we're dead center nationally on total cost of care. You only get bonuses if you're up here in high quality, low cost, and you get penalties. All these practices over here, all these dots over here, they're all getting Medicare penalties today because their costs are too high or the quality is too low. So this is real and it's going to follow you for the rest of your career. This is a cost report. So I picked one of our bad ones. So here's hip arthroplasty for OU physicians. Our cost of care for hip arthroplasty are 16% above what's expected. And you'll get the same report because in 2017 law mandates that all physician practices get this report. You can see we're below cost on simple and modified radical mastectomy. So they're holding us accountable for cost of care and they're adjusting physician practice and hospital payment based on these costs. And then finally, in a big group like mine, one of the new challenges is how do you change physician compensation? Because we're now starting, so I have a group of doctors that actually work for our practice. They're employed doctors. We built quality metrics into their contracts. If their quality of care doesn't improve, uh, they don't get any incentive payments. We're holding the doctors accountable now in our practice for the quality of care they delivered, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to start thinking about cost of care. But just expect that if you go out into the future and go into an employed practice where they're actually monitoring these things because we're all being held accountable now for cost and quality of care. So in summary, there's going to be this major change in the financing of health care in the United States. This focus on value. Remember, value is high quality care, high patient satisfaction, divided by cost. You want low cost, high quality, high satisfaction. There's going to be complete transparency. All this data is in the public domain. And as I showed you, CMS is now letting people download the data. You send it to CMS and then they put it into a big file and let researchers and others download it and use it. And there will be payment penalties or rewards based on your overall cost or quality of care. Your trainees now in a medical center, part of OSU, and you're going to have impact on those metrics for the rest of your career here, 
I want you to think about that. You are going to impact the quality and cost of care for this medical center, which impacts the hospital's payment. And the hospital penalty payments can be substantial. About 6% of a hospital's Medicare payment, think about all the dollars a hospital gets from the Medicare program, 6% are at risk. So how you interact with patients, how you think about delivering care, the quality, cost, the efficiency of care will impact payment to this hospital and any others that you work at subsequently in the future. So I hope I haven't completely scared you to death, but what I wanted to do was to give you a sense that you as trainees in this program have an important role to play on both improving the quality of care for the patients in this center, but also thinking about those metrics that are going to be used to determine payment for OSU Medical Center. It's really a pleasure to be back at OSU today, um, and I'm happy. I, here's my email address. Please feel free to send me questions if you have any. Thank you.